In this lecture, we're going to be reviewing some of the basics of atomic structure. A lot of this is going to be review for many of you, but it is worth going over. It's amazing how much of this stuff people forget. When we visualize the structure of an atom, we generally think of it having two regions. A nucleus at the center of an atom that contains two types of particles, protons, which are positive, and neutrons, which are neutral or uncharged. Outside of that, we have orbitals that contain electrons, which are negative. Now, most of the mass of an atom is contained within the nucleus. Those two nuclear particles, protons and neutrons, are about 1,600 times more massive than an electron. And that means that over 99.9% .9 of the mass of an atom is actually contained within the nucleus. Now, the size of an atom is actually dictated by those orbitals. They are, in a relative sense, very, very far away from the nucleus. Now, there are a number of atomic properties and terms that we're going to review. And again, a lot of this is going to be familiar to a lot of you, but it is amazing how much of this stuff is forgotten or terms can be confused. The atomic number of an element is simply the total number of protons that are in the nucleus. And this number is unique for each element. So here I've got kind of a blow up of the carbon atom from the periodic table. And up in the top right corner, you can see I have the atomic number of six. And that means that every carbon atom in the universe is going to have six protons in it. It's what defines the actual element. We also have a mass number, which is the total number of nuclear particles. That is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. And this is a close approximation of the mass of an atom. Remember, protons and neutrons are way more massive than electrons are. Now, the atomic mass is the actual mass of an atom. That includes protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now, if you look at our little elemental representation here from the periodic table, you'll notice that atomic mass and mass number aren't actually represented. And that's because different atoms of the same element can have different mass numbers and therefore different atomic masses. In fact, we call those isotopes. Isotopes are just different atoms of the same element that have different mass numbers. And this is caused by a differing number of neutrons. Remember, the number of protons, the atomic number, defines the actual element. So the only way we can change the mass number is by altering the number of neutrons. Now, if needed, we can actually specify which isotope of a given element we are dealing with. We do this by incorporating the mass number when we draw it out. We simply include the mass number as a prefix placed before the elemental symbol. So here I have carbon-12 and carbon-13 isotopes drawn. The last of these terms that I want to talk about is the atomic weight. And this is a weighted average of all the natural isotopes of an element. And this is usually represented on the periodic table. If you look at the carbon I have drawn out here, the atomic weight is 12.011. Now, chemistry is really about the interaction of electrons and orbitals. So we're going to spend a good bit of time talking about orbitals. We tend to think of orbitals as containing electrons. An orbital really is nothing more than a volume of space where electrons are likely to be. It's technically defined by rather complex mathematical functions that describe a probability density of electrons, where the electrons are likely to be and how likely they are to be there. Now, atomic orbitals are orbitals that belong to only one atom, and they come in a lot of different shapes. You've probably seen these in other courses. S orbitals are spherically shaped. P orbitals are peanut shaped. D orbitals are kind of weirdly shaped. In fact, they're not even consistent. Different D orbitals actually have different shapes. And then F orbitals, which again are very weirdly shaped and also aren't the same. Some F orbitals look different than others. Now, when studying organic chemistry, most of the time we're gonna be dealing with only S and P orbitals. So here I've got some 3D models of what these orbitals look like. And as you can see, we have a spherical S orbital with the nucleus at the center and these peanut-shaped p orbitals. Now, you'll notice that these p orbitals actually have two globs of electron density on either side of the nucleus, and we call those globs lobes. So p orbitals are lobed orbitals. Now we're going to start looking at how electrons are actually placed into atoms. Orbitals themselves are actually grouped into what are called shells, electron shells. These are just concentric groupings of atomic orbitals. Now, electron shells are numbered consecutively 
starting from the nearest ones to the nucleus. So we have the first shell close to the nucleus, then the second shell a little further away, etc. Now each shell has its own unique set of orbitals. And we can actually predict what orbitals are present in a given shell with just a couple of little rules. Each shell introduces a new orbital type. The first shell has only one type of orbital, an s orbital. The second shell also has p orbitals. The third shell now has d orbitals, and the fourth shell now also has f orbitals. You see that the order here, s, p, d, f, is the same order we kind of introduce those atomic orbitals, right? Now, how many of each of those orbital types a given shell has can also be predicted. It follows the odd numerical sequence. That is 1, 3, 5, 7. So the first shell, which we know only has s orbital types, has only one s orbital, because 1 is the first number in the odd numerical sequence. In fact, we call that a 1s orbital, 1 meaning that it's in the first shell. The second shell has its own s orbital, which we call a 2s orbital because it's in the second shell. But because it's the second shell, we now introduce the next orbital type, which is p, and there are three p orbitals in that second shell because 3 is now the next number in the odd numerical sequence. The third shell, again, has its own s orbital, which we call a 3s orbital. It has its own set of p orbitals, which we now call 3p. And now, because it's the third shell, we introduce a new orbital type. The next orbital type is d. And there are five of these d orbitals, because five is the next number in the odd numerical sequence. And we call these 3d orbitals because they're in the third shell. Now, it's important to remember that shells accumulate. If you look at the periodic table, you can actually tell what the outermost shell of a given element actually is. It's basically correlated to the row. So looking at the first row, we have hydrogen and helium. And that means that hydrogen and helium, being in the first row, have only first shell orbitals available. If you look at the second row, an atom like carbon, for example, is going to have both first and second shell orbitals available to it, the second shell being the outermost shell. So if you think about it, carbon actually has a total of five orbitals. It has that one 1s orbital in the first shell, and then it has a 2s orbital in the second shell, and the three 2p orbitals also in that second shell. Now, these different orbital types actually have different energies associated with them. We can make a couple of correlations. If you compare the same orbital type, that is by letter, then the energy increases as you get further and further away from the nucleus. It increases as you go through the consecutive shells. So if we look at s orbitals, because every shell has an s orbital, the lowest energy s orbital is going to be the 1s orbital in that first shell. And then the 2s orbital, the 3s orbital, and then the 4s orbital being the highest of those four. We can also compare the different letter types within a given shell. If we looked at, say, the fourth shell, which has all four orbital types, s, p, d, and f, then the energies actually go in that order. S orbitals within a shell are going to be the lowest in energy, followed by P, then D, and then F orbitals being the highest energy. The last thing we need to look at is the energy correlation amongst orbitals of the same type in the same shell. And those are called degenerate orbitals. And degenerate orbitals have the exact same energy. So if you think about the three 2p orbitals, sometimes labeled Px, Py, and Pz because they're all perpendicular to one another, they all have the exact same energy. So degenerate orbitals have the same energy. Now we can use all of this information to actually predict the relative energies of various orbitals. So if we looked at, say, something like a carbon atom, the carbon atom is in the second row, so it has both first and second shell orbitals available to it. We know that the 1s orbital is going to be lower in energy than the 2s orbital. And if we depict these orbitals as just little horizontal lines, we can place them on the screen here with the 1s orbital being lower on the screen, therefore lower in energy, and then the 2s orbital above that. We also know that 2p orbitals are higher in energy than 2s orbitals. So we can place the 2p orbitals a little higher up, a little higher in energy than the 2s. And we know that the three 2p orbitals, because they're degenerate, all have the same energy. So we can place those at the exact same height because they have the same energy. So this was what the actual orbital energies would look like for a second shell element like carbon. So now that we know all about orbital energies, we can start talking about how these actual orbitals are populated with electrons. We call that electronic configuration. 
An electronic configuration is just a description of how the electrons in an atom are distributed amongst its orbitals. One way that electronic configuration is described is to use a string like this. You've probably seen something like this before. 1s2, 2s2, 2p2 for a carbon atom, for example. And what this is saying is that we have two electrons in a 1s orbital, two electrons in a 2s orbital, and, well, two electrons in 2p orbital or orbitals. This is a useful way of depicting electronic configuration, but it is a little ambiguous. Remember that there are in fact three 2p orbitals. And from this depiction, we can't really tell if those two p electrons are in the same p orbital or in different p orbitals. So we're gonna to continue to use these little horizontal lines to represent the different orbitals at different energies for these atoms. Now there are three general rules for how electrons populate the orbitals. The first one is the Pauli exclusion principle, and this is kind of a two for one. The first part states that an orbital can contain no more than two electrons. And that means that an orbital actually has sort of three population states. It can be empty with no electrons, it can have one electron, or it can have two, and that's it. The other part of the Pauli exclusion principle deals with electron spin. And it simply says that electrons in the same orbital have to have opposing spin. So if we're using these little horizontal lines to represent orbitals, we're going to use arrows to represent the electrons in them. And we're going to show opposing spin simply by having arrows pointing in opposite directions. So if you think about it, the first elements in the periodic table, the first row has two elements, hydrogen and helium. We know that the first row represents the first shell, and the first shell only has one orbital, a 1s orbital. So if we look at the electronic configuration of a hydrogen atom, we have only one orbital, the 1s orbital, and, well, how many electrons do we have? Well, we can figure that out by looking at the atomic number. The atomic number of hydrogen is one. That means it has one positively charged proton in the nucleus. And if we want to talk about the neutral hydrogen atom, that would mean we need one negatively charged electron to balance the charge to zero. So with one electron, and only one orbital to put it, the electronic configuration of hydrogen is pretty simple. We simply place an electron into that 1s orbital. For helium, we have two electrons, right? Because we have two protons, we need to balance that with two electrons, again, if we're talking about the neutral atom. So we place two electrons into that 1s orbital. And because we're putting two electrons in the same orbital, we have to give them opposing spin. And we'll represent that by having our electrons, our arrows, pointing in opposite directions. The next rule is the Aufbau principle, which says that an electron will always occupy the unfilled orbital of lowest energy. Now, with hydrogen and helium, we didn't have a choice. We only had one orbital. But once we look at the next elements, lithium and beryllium, we actually have both first and second shell orbitals. So we now have five orbitals to populate. So lithium with an atomic number of three. It's gonna have three protons. And if we wanna look at the neutral lithium atom, it would have three electrons to balance that charge. With three electrons and five orbitals, how are we going to populate those orbitals? Well, the Aufbau principle says to start populating at the lowest energy orbital available, and that's the 1s orbital for lithium. So we place the first electron into the 1s orbital. We place the second electron into the 1s orbital because we're allowed to put as many as two electrons into an orbital. And now the third electron, we can't put it in the 1s orbital because Pauli says that you can only put as many as two electrons in an orbital. So that third electron has to go into the next lowest energy orbital available, and that's the 2s orbital. Looking at the next element, beryllium, has an atomic number of four, so the neutral beryllium atom would have four electrons. We would populate the orbitals similarly. We would start with the lowest energy orbital available, 1s, put two electrons there, put the third electron into that 2s orbital, and then the fourth electron can also go into that 2s orbital, filling it. Now the last rule we have to look at is Hund's rule. And Hund's rule deals with degenerate orbitals. And it simply says that electrons will prefer to occupy empty degenerate orbitals over occupied degenerate orbitals. So if we look at the next elements in the periodic table, boron and carbon. Boron has an atomic number five, so five protons, and to neutralize it, five electrons. So the first two electrons would go into that 1s orbital, the next two electrons would go into the next lowest energy orbital, the 2s orbital. 
And now we have three 2p orbitals that are all the same in energy, so we can place the fifth electron in any one of them. It really doesn't matter, they're all the same. Hund's rule applies once we start looking at other elements like carbon. Carbon has an atomic number of six, so six protons, and therefore six electrons to neutralize that charge. We can populate the orbitals by starting with the 1s, putting two electrons there, then two electrons into the 2s, one electron into one of the p orbitals, and now we invoke Hund's rule, which says that we don't place an electron into an occupied p orbital, we would rather place it into an empty p orbital. And that's exactly what we do. We pick one of the other two empty p orbitals and place that sixth electron there. Now it turns out that atoms are not locked into one specific electronic configuration. If we obey all of those rules, the Pauli exclusion principle, the Aufbau principle, and Hund's rule, then the atom is said to be in the ground electronic configuration. And it's the most stable configuration possible. If we were to apply some energy to this atom, we could actually create an excited state. An excited state is when one of those rules, typically the Aufbau principle, has been violated. So in this case, if I apply energy, I can lift one of those 2s electrons up into a 2p orbital. We call that an excited state, and it's a higher energy configuration. One last thing I want to talk about is the distinction between core electrons and valence electrons. Core electrons are electrons that are inside of an inner filled shell. So if we look at a carbon atom in the ground state, for example, we have two shells, the first shell and the second shell. The first shell only has one orbital, the 1s orbital, and we can see that that 1s orbital is filled. And that means that the entire shell is filled since it only has that one orbital. So those two electrons in that 1s orbital are core electrons. The orbital is called a core orbital as well. Valence electrons are electrons in the outermost shell. So again, looking at carbon, we have two shells, the first shell and the second shell. And we can see that the second shell has two different types of orbitals, four total, and they're not all filled. And that means that all four of those orbitals and their electrons are considered valence, right? Not just the p orbitals. The entire shell is not filled, so all four of those electrons are considered valence electrons, and the orbitals considered valence orbitals.